Hello, and welcome to this online format of Talking Galleries. Thanks for joining us in this series of panels about gallery practices and the art market. We want to understand the consequences of the pandemic in this industry and the digital challenges we are facing today. Our aim is to analyze the market's current situation and inspire and help us visualize where are we going in the next month. Today, we're having our last session of this new format. As I think Dan devoted to generating debate and knowledge, we began weeks ago with some very interesting sessions in Spanish. We also had sessions in English, like the one on digital solutions in the face of COVID-19. In previous sessions, we have analyzed the future of the art fairs with Global Director of Art Basel Fairs, Mark Spiegler. We have explored the data of the art market with Anders Peterson of Artactic and the future of this market with Alain Servé and Andras Sanso. And last Monday, we have discussed about digital innovation tools for galleries with three promising techie projects. Let me tell you that all these sessions are being uploaded on our website and are accessible to everybody. So moving on to today's program, we are going to talk about galleries leaning into the new normal, digital innovation and local engagement. We have a very special moderator, Rebecca Taylor, Arts and Culture Strategies, based in London. I'm sure a new company, the real Rebecca Taylor, will have a big success. I hope you all find the session interesting and profitable. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lucia, and thank you for inviting me to uh, moderate this incredibly uh, important panel about how galleries are pivoting in this in this post post COVID or sort of late COVID moment as we try and find and navigate the new normal. We hope today's conversation will be interesting and informative for all of you, whether this is your first TG online session or you've attended all of them. We've designed today's conversation, both in terms of the panelists we've invited and the topics we're going to cover, to offer you both a global view of challenges facing galleries, but also a more nuanced understanding of specific regional and local challenges of a gallery in Brazil, or a gallery in Berlin, or one in Hong Kong. We're also hoping to offer you the perspectives of different gallery sizes, a gallery that might only have one space, but be very important on that continent, or others who have multiple spaces. So um, most importantly, we really hope to offer you an honest and transparent conversation about not just the challenges galleries face during this time, because I think we're all fairly familiar with those challenges, but also the solutions they tried and how effective or ineffective they might have been for them. Our esteemed panelists today include Tiago Gomid from Bergamin and Gomid in Sao Paulo, Yvonne Fong from Simon Lee Gallery, in Hong Kong. And unfortunately, Johan Koenig, who was meant to join us, will not be able to participate today. So Laura Atanasio, Senior Director of Koenig Gallery in Berlin, will join on his behalf, in behalf of the gallery. So now to kick us off, I'd like to invite each of our gallerists to start our conversation with a brief state of the state about their local situation during this past year how dramatically their business was impacted by COVID-19, what were sort of the regional nuances of, of uh, COVID restrictions, how was business able to operate, did it have to go completely online, et cetera, and then a little bit into how they're starting to navigate the new normal. Let's start with Tiago in Sao Paulo, and we'll work our way east because we have an amazing situation here where we have someone from Hong Kong, Brazil, and Germany all on one call the beauty of Zoom. So while it's a shame we can't all be together in person in Barcelona, the Zoom nature, or the online nature of this allows us to be together digitally. So go ahead, Tiago, please kick us off. Well, uh, hello and uh, thank you all for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I've always been a fan of the, of the, of the event of Talking Galleries. So it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, how should I start? Uh, I think uh, before this pandemic started, uh, we, our gallery is uh, seven years old and we have one space in Sao Paulo and we are, uh, our program is mainly focused on 
the second half of the 20th century and we specialize in Brazilian art. So my background, I worked for many years for a museum, for a contemporary art museum, and then I worked for an auction house. So when I, when I decided to start the gallery, it made sense, it made a lot of sense to, to, to do a more historical program. So that's the approach that we had. So we've, we've mastered that program for the past seven years and uh, we've been doing super well. Um, however, myself and Antonia Bergamin, my partner, are very young, so we have always flirt with the idea of having also a primary program once we once we felt more economically uh, secure so this pandemic was very interesting for us to to so that we could de develop some of these aspects of the gallery so when we we had a, we had a project uh, so last year we we do eight fairs a year we do all three Basels we do TEF of New York and we do Fiat and we do two fairs in Brazil the São Paulo and the Rio Fair so we had the project we had the, we started off the year with an exhibition at the gallery and we were going to do uh, Hong Kong. So that was the first. The, that was the first. Uh, uh, that was the first uh, affair that was canceled. Therefore, we had to come up with new strategies and uh, and develop new ideas to to navigate through around those 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 different, you know, Brazil uh, closed, uh, we closed, uh, COVID came around March 15th. So that's when we had to close the gallery. So I think I'm, should I, am I going to, am I, can I go on, Rebecca? Oh. Please, I think, I think it's really helpful for people to have the background because not everyone will have been to Sao Paulo and know your space. Many will have seen you at, at our Basels um, or the like, but but many others may not. So I think that the background and the specific context for your gallery is, is important. So we were very strongly hit in mid-March. And uh, so we closed the gallery. We sent all the staff home. And uh, we had no idea where to start. I mean, we, it's not like we had like a completely, we were super digital or anything. I mean, we had, a, we had our social media, we had our newsletters, we had our emails, alerts, we had our Instagram accounts and etc. But we didn't have any real strategy, online strategy. We were more, we were basically traveling the world around and, and doing everything very much uh, face to face. So the second fair that was canceled was the Sao Paulo Art Fair. That was the 1st of April. Yeah. So for that fair, we had uh, two booths. We had one regular booth, and then we had a second booth where we would have an exhibition of Andy Warhol uh, Polaroid photographs from a collection in LA. And then, so that fair was canceled, but all that material was already here in Brazil. All the photographs. Uh, so we decided to move. So we canceled the exhibition that we had at the gallery and we decided to have the, 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 the Polaroid, uh, Andy Warhol Polaroid exhibition at the gallery. But then that, because we thought the pandemic was gonna last a few weeks. But that proved uh, that we were wrong. So that was, I think, that was exactly the first time that we realized that we needed to change the strategy. We need, like this is gonna last. Yeah. Like this is gonna go much longer than we expected. So what are we gonna do? Okay. So we have all. So the first idea that we had was to, since we had. I mean, the, the, the works that we had for the regular booth at the Sao Paulo Art Fair, we could save them for another time. 
But the works that we shipped from Los Angeles, the Andy Warhol photographs, that we had a, we only had like a three month contract. We needed to send those back. So we needed to do something with that, with, with, with that exhibition. So we had the idea of, everyone was very much in lockdown at that point. Everyone was completely, nobody was leaving. It was like, it was the most severe uh, time of the pandemic in, in Brazil. So we decided instead of, instead of uh, having people come to the exhibition or whatever the way you know, usually works, we decided that the exhibition should come to people's homes. So we, so Andy, when he did those Polaroids, uh, there was always a, this characteristic where how people used to dress and how the light was done and how the makeup was kind of created. There was the, 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 how the hands were like, you know, there was a sort of, you can easily identify when is an Andy Warhol Polaroid. So we invited a lot of. So we meet. We did a. We did a. We did a. We, together with Act, which is a local uh, advisory and uh, firm, we and also we invited the makeup company Nars. So we all the three of us we we came up with this idea and we did this 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 this, this project that was called the Andy Warhol Challenge. So you were at home, you were supposed to kind of dress up and try to post online a, 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 a kind of a selfie, not a selfie, but a, 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 like a photo of, if you were photographed by Andy Warhol for a Polaroid, how would that be? So you, you had to do that on your own. So it was something fun to do while you were, you were quarantined with your family and with the kids and then so we and we had over a thousand people uh, posting uh, online photos of themselves dressed up as they were they would be on an Andy Warhol Polaroid. So that was the first very very and, and together with that we launched the exhibition. Then we sent out PDFs and we we promoted the exhibition. But it was already something that was really happening. It was all over everyone's screen. Uh, over a week or something. So that was the, our very first successful experience on, and that brought, I think that brought together the, the, the gallery team and, and we got super excited about, you know, we can do a lot of great and fun stuff from without having to travel or to have people come to the gallery. So I think that was the first time that we, that we learned that we could, we could do we could do we could still do fun things and and bring content to people and to collectors and to the public without actually having to put on a real exhibition i think i have well i could go on forever but i think so. that's great thank you that's a that's a great intro and i think we'll explore a, a little more where you're headed in in our future topics lara do you want to um describe sort of the situation sure. in Berlin and also feel free. I know Koenig has spaces in Tokyo and in London, if you want to address any of those as well. Sure. So the gallery was founded in 2002 when Johan was just 18 years old. Um, so it was completely different from, from what it is now, um, which he built up from scratch. Now we have a huge building in Berlin. We have a gallery in Tokyo. We have a gallery in London. Um, but with Berlin being our flagship and um, with 40 to 50 people working there, um, it's quite a big operation uh, in the meantime. I mean, I've been with the gallery since um, seven years, um, so I've seen a changing uh, life. Um, as for COVID, um, I think that uh, we were in shock when it first started. We decided not to do Hong Kong in advance because um, we were already worried about the riots and we didn't really want to move into a political climate that we weren't sure about. And so we actually um, got out of this uh, okay um, and decided to cut down on fares before COVID hit. So it was a little bit different for us because the only thing um, that we missed was Basel for sure, and also several exhibitions. 
And what we consider ourselves very lucky in Germany, though, that we have someone uh, who's advising us very well. He's not a politician, he's um, a scientist. So at the beginning, we were really, we didn't know what was happening, you know, how can it be, um, how can you catch the virus, what can we do, who can we meet? But um, with this virologist, we surely became safer quicker, I think, that we knew how the um, how we can meet people, how many people can meet. Um, so I think it was kind of a safe time for us. So in the beginning, I think we shut down for six weeks. We canceled everything. The first thing we did was touch base with our artists because they were worried. Um, and we um, discussed strategies, like for example, what can we sell now? Um, I think with my artists, what we decided on was to sell things that are cheaper, but unique works, like they had enough time to work on smaller works um, that had a unique character because now they actually didn't have to travel. So that was a good change for us and it shouldn't be too expensive. So this was what kept it going the entire time. Um, so a kind of high demand works as well. So what can we consider high demand works? What people always wanted, what wasn't available at the time maybe, um, because artists didn't have time to do it. So now we made it happen. Um, so this was the first five, six weeks and we went out of this okay and then we slowly got into it again i mean no fares but i think what we did uh, which was very different to what the others did is we created our own art fair in the gallery space because it's rather large so we invited all the small galleries from berlin um as well as europe um our uh, collectors, our artists, or just artists in general that aren't represented by any gallery to hand in their work. So we built up our own fair with all precautions, all safety. Um, so yeah, this was a local fair that hasn't, this was the first fair we did actually. And it was in June, so quite early. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Yvonne, you want to share with us what the situation was in Hong Kong. I know it started much earlier there for you and has sort of been both more and less dramatic in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this year has been like real reality, I think that confronts um, all of us. And I think there are a lot of new issues that we don't, um, we don't understand or prepare for. And um, being here in Hong Kong, I have witnessed the city under fire and water since um, June 2019 due to, you know, political unrest. And then, yeah, so we're in a Petter building and Petter Street. And then, yeah, the whole street was like ground zero, basically, battlefield. Um, so we're forced to basically, you know, temporarily close for, um, I think, almost two months, I think, like on and off. Um, and then um, the pandemic hit us hard in February earlier this year. Um, so, and then we went through several lockdowns and everything. Um, and I think there are questions whether um, of confidence in Hong Kong's um, thriving art scene, as well as uh, I think its position as an international hub of creativity, you know, with Art Basel Hong Kong canceling in March. So I think people are skeptical and not sure what to do. Um, so we already planted a Gary Simmons show um, in a Hong Kong gallery as well. And that's, you know, obviously being canceled. And we didn't really get to, um, you know, to do this show until earlier July. So, but I think the people in Hong Kong, you know, we, I think we quickly get used to, you know, working from home actually. And I think, and I think the residents in Hong Kong, we adapt very quickly. We, we move things online right away. And then I think in general, I think everyone, you know, follow the government rules and social distancing restrictions. I think which made the city, I think recover much quicker than other cities globally. Um, and business wise, I think we're slowly picking up now, you know, so all our spaces in Hong Kong, New York and London, we're fully open with um, new exhibitions. And, um, yeah, and with our Hong Kong space, we just opened a new show um, just two weeks ago. 
And I think thanks to all the local support, you know, um, we have, we received a really great uh, reception. And I think you know the spring auctions in Hong Kong and um, back in July also achieved like you know tremendous results. I think I think that demonstrates that you know the art market is still very much um, solid. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So um, that's a great sort of um, context for all of us going into kind of the two sort of prongs I want to focus on here, because it seems like um, a lot of gallerists either survived the pandemic through embracing the digital and you know getting online or through really leaning into their local community. Although the two are not remotely mutually exclusive, some gallerists were able to successfully do both. So I'd like to now kind of go through each of those topics. Let's start with the digital. Um, I'm not really going to explore the various in t- technologies and platforms and, and how they're used because those were already addressed in a previous talk. But today I'd like to ask each of our gallerists to share their experience with trying to use the various digital platforms, whether it was Art Basel or another fair's OVRs, maybe David Werner's platform, a self-operated OVR, Artsy, or what other, whatever digital platform they might've engaged in. How, how was that for them? So one, which platform did you use and how successful were each? Why don't we start with Laura, since she already sort of alluded a little bit to this. Sure, Um, I have to say that for us, the the most successful one was the Instagram because uh, Johan created this one, which was called 10 AM series. um, And he spoke every day, he spoke to different guests. And we started off with the artists, the artists showing off their studios um, in Basel, in Berlin, in New York. So, what people did, they actually looked at what they have in their studio and they wrote on Instagram, how can I buy it? I want to buy it. So this was the most successful from all of them because um, we tried the other OVRs, but honestly, I think we're not there yet um, because it's not really personal. It's no personal touch. It's really just looking at works as if you would look as a in a PDF. The 10 a.m. series was really you could see how the artists talked about the works, um, how Johan spoke about them. Um, we filmed them in the gallery. We built up big sculptures, um, but no other platform worked for us. That's, that's I really think this will change in the future, but at the moment... Yeah, I think it's, it's a learning curve for sure, but I think yeah. that, that's an important lesson is that things were not immediately successful necessarily. Yeah. Or perhaps there's the balance of, okay, well, there were no economics involved. We didn't have to spend the money we usually spend on an art fair or, or et cetera. So even if we made one sale, it actually was profitable in terms of basic ROI, but it didn't feel like a yeah. success for us. So I, I think that's yeah. interesting feedback and, and something that I think everyone will have to take into consideration as they start charging for these platforms. For um, sure. I think so too. Yeah. Tiago? Yeah, well, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we started uh, working on these ideas of how we could uh, create content online. Yeah. So I agree with Laura. Instagram was 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 our main uh, way to communicate uh, with uh, with our audience. So I've got a few numbers here, uh, like uh, you know, of course, we did several activities of how to create content. We did a series of live uh, conversations where, where I, I would do one every week, either with an artist or always about a different topic. And Antonio, my partner, would do another one. And Clara, our, our director, would do another one. So we had three, three live interviews uh, per week. And we had a lot of, con- we were posting a lot of content. Uh, we have uh, we have Camilla who works at a gallery and does our our social media. We we actually I think it was about a year and a half ago or something. We used to have a company that would do our press for us, a, uh, a, a not outside company. And then we realized that uh, things were going so much on, on into the digital that we that for the same amount that we were paying this press company, we could. We could uh, we could have just one person full time 
at the gallery just working on our social media. So that's what we did. And then she really, she really created some incredible content during the pandemic. So for example, we used to grow about a hundred followers a month, a little over a hundred followers a month before the pandemic. Now we are growing 500 followers a month. So, and we also, we also did a project where we introduced the whole team of the gallery, which is super successful too. And we also have some numbers here from, from our artsy platform. We had like in September, 2019, we got nine, we got 17 emails from artsy. This September we got like from inquiries of so collectors inquiring. We got 17 in September, 2019. And this September, we got 264. Interesting. So, so it, but at the same time, we didn't meet anyone anywhere in the world. So, yeah. I mean, now, very do those leads feel like qualified leads? Because that's an amazing quantitative growth. But I'm curious if it felt like those, you know, 200 leads were there, was there enough? actual meat in there that it felt like, yep, this is great value and the return on our time for having to then respond to these. Cause I know that's one of the complaints that um, we hear sometimes from gallerists about the various platforms is, you know, whether or not the queries are, are feel relevant. No, our sales are down about 50% from last year up to this moment. But at the same time, our, we, our, uh, our overhead is down 58%, no, 49%. Our sales are down 58%, but our overhead is down 49%. Yeah, so it, it helps to balance a little bit. Um, yeah. Just to ask both you and Laura, I'm curious if you felt any sort of content fatigue after a few months of lockdown. One of the things we saw was that the galleries who were quickest to do things like Johan's talk, you know, 10 a.m. series or, or your series to go, saw great numbers in the beginning, but then those quickly started diminishing maybe two months in when sort of digital fatigue started to set in. Did you feel that at all or did you see that the interest stayed spiked throughout? I mean, I wouldn't call it digital fatigue. It's just that people started going out again. It was summer. They went to the park, what they were allowed to do. They knew how to handle the virus. So they were going on walks. So people were not sitting at home uh, looking well, at Well, Berlin, screen. they weren't just sitting changed. at home. Some of us still were well into the summer. So uh, Yeah, you're probably right. I, I'm, I didn't know I that you weren't allowed. I mean, I think you were allowed to walk around the block with your mask on, I think this was the worst that could happen to you, right? Because you, but you were allowed to go out and you knew how to handle it. Um, so I, I mean, I don't think it's digital fatigue. I think this has changed, but that's just okay. my opinion. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting feedback because um, in looking at a lot of numbers, I saw a sharp decline in these series from the yeah, month sure. engagement towards yeah. later on. But you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not necessarily just fatigue, it's also people started to get back to normal in certain parts of the world. Yeah. Um, Yvonne, let me put it back over to you because because we didn't get to, to speak on this topic yet. Mm -hmm. So I think as with everyone, we also took part in like the Basel online viewing room, Ocula, Artsy, um, and I think there were a lot of interests and inquiries as well. And I think a great thing about us is, you know, we have staff here in Hong Kong, like, in New York, so so we basically we have, we have assigned a time slot for for our staff from three different spaces, so we don't miss out on you know the inquiries due to time differences, okay. and then we can like you know respond very quickly to um, collectors around the world. Um, and I think you know clients sort of they respond to like you know, the transparency of information. You know, I think for Basel and then for upcoming freeze online viewing room, we're also you know. I think just be a bit more transparent. I think mean, like disclosing, you know, maybe certain prices, you know, um, like our details, etc. So I think you know that's pretty helpful for a lot of um, you know audiences, you know, because some of them, you know, they might be a bit too intimidated to ask, you know. So I think it's kind of nice, you know, we, you know, we're open about it. 
Yeah, I think we've always heard those statistics from places like Artsy, and that's why Art Basel decided with its first online viewing room to sort of require at least a price range. And it's great to hear that that's proven mm -hmm. to be the experience for everyone is that this new level of transparency, it does do a sort of, as they say, and lead to more qualified leads. I'm curious, and you can address this one or, or any of our other panelists as well. Um, there's sort of been a notion or sort of cliche going around that 2D works like photography and painting would do better in these online viewing rooms than say sculpture. It sort of stands to logical reasoning. I'm curious if that was your experience or if you didn't really see any difference or did you focus solely on a certain medium as opposed to another because of experiences of what was selling? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the flat medium definitely you know, worked much better than you know, 3D sculptures or, um, you know, you know, works that are moving or with lights or sounds. Um, but um, I mean, the other two gal, they've touched on Instagram already. So I, I want to focus maybe a bit on, you know, WeChat. And I think that's something Great. that's quite regional for us. Um, I think, yeah, in terms of showing, you know, like, um, you know, like 3D work. So we've been using WeChat as a platform to, um, you know, we post videos, which I think are very, very important for, you know, our you know clients you know based in Asia or China to um, to really see the dimensionality of works you know they can view the works from all different angles, and we have had you know pretty successful um, and positive feedback from you know our clients based in um, China you know through WeChat. Mm -hmm. um, we're also you know recently we're also exploring this new app called um, Zai Art. You know, so it's um so it's actually China's most popular um art live streaming platform where they show exhibition tours and talks, um and museums use it a lot. So we had very very positive feedback on the viewing. Um and it's free, it's complimentary, and then we attracted a, like you know, a new type of younger audience for that. Um and we have yeah so and we're working towards like you know generating um maybe sales in the future. That's great. And I'm glad you mentioned WeChat because that has been, I think, just as important as Instagram may have been for the Western galleries, for, for the Chinese galleries, a, a hugely important selling tool, educational tool, connectivity tool, all, all of the above for, for staying yeah. in touch with each other. Um, in terms of both platforms and what was selling and even just conversations you were having not digitally related, were you finding, and this is to all of you, were you finding it easier to sell artists who your collectors already had a familiar relationship with? You know, it, it feels like it stands to reason that they'd be more likely to buy an artist that they they know and respect. Tiago, it probably applies less to you given that almost all of your artists are are historical and, and very well known. But I'm curious for, for you. I to talk about this. Should I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, so uh, as I sort of started mentioning, uh, Antonia and I have always flirted with the idea of having a, representing younger artists. We, we work with a few states and we do a lot of, uh, a lot of secondary on Brazilian, uh, very mm. important uh, uh, 20th century artists, but we always wanted to, to, to work with the, to have our own team of artists younger from our generation or younger, so I so after I think after March uh, after May or June we 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 kind of realized that this was this was probably gonna last until the end of the year or so. So it gave us the chance of actually working a lot within the community. So we. We started uh, researching uh, on this project of working with with the of creating a team of artists. So we did a lot of studio visits. We have we're still doing a lot of studio visits, which is something that we used, didn't use, we usually didn't have the time to do. We didn't have because it's not that just the studio visits. You have to study and you have to research and you have to talk and you have to discuss if that makes sense or if that doesn't make sense. So, and also there was a great offer of real estate uh, because of a, a lot of 
a lot of uh, shops and restaurants, etc., were closing around the gallery. So we actually uh, got a new space. So we're going to have our second space in Sao Paulo, which we are probably going to open in March. And so we're going to be able to have twice as much exhibitions as we used to have. So that was, so parallel to that, we were invited to all these different uh, dig, uh, online fairs. So there was this art fair called uh, Not Cancelled, and there was this local art fair from the Gallery Association, and then there was another fair from, we did like three or four very small online fairs, nothing like our pause or freeze or anything, they were much smaller. So we, what we did is like, we invited some of these artists that we were researching and, and doing studio visits with them to do a project uh, for these online fairs. So we did all these solo projects and, uh, and we did extremely well with them. So, uh, so when you ask if, if, if we're selling very well-known artists or not. So we, we, we were working with artists that were fairly not known and they were very young and we did extremely well with them uh, and so I think uh, I think a lot of a lot of especially young collectors or young people that were weren't even collectors because a lot of the people in their 30s 40s or uh, they are it's probably the busiest time of their lives because they have young children and they're building their careers and they're building their first home or so it's very hard and they a lot of, i think a lot of people actually really wanted to start collecting or start engaging with with the artwork but they did actually just didn't have the time because they felt it was something that they had to do in person so now a lot of these I see that a lot of these people have much more time in their hands because they don't go to restaurants, they don't travel as much, they don't, so they have a lot of time in their hands. So we've been having amazing uh, uh, discussions with a lot of young collectors about the local scene, about young artists, about, you know, it has been very fulfilling and we are super excited about uh, this, this new phase of the gallery where we're going to still have our program, our 20th century program, but we will also have a, a team of, of, of artists of our own. That's incredibly exciting. And, and I think what you've just shared will be really um, music to some smaller galleries ears um, on, on two levels. One, I think there was a lot of uh, fear that only big name brands would do well. You know, of course, Gagosian would sell out an online viewing room. Their artists are so well known, but how would how would smaller galleries do? So I think that's really important feedback. But to that second point you just made about young collectors, I think it's very true, um, both about new collectors starting to do kind of do their homework and finally be less afraid um, yeah. because of the transparency Yvonne was referring to and, and other factors, more time, as you said. But then I also think there was a little bit of um, older collectors who had more time and were starting to do research as well and saying, oh, perhaps I should explore this or maybe while I wander in these online viewing rooms, I won't just go to the seven galleries I usually go to when I'm at the fair and then then call it a day. So I think the extra time that people had for serious collectors or aspiring collectors actually proved to, to be beneficial in many cases and, and did yield some sales for galleries, which is you know, great news. Yeah, I think I think also the collectors have time to explore other artists in the program of that yeah. gallery that they already are used to buy it. Absolutely. You know, but they are they are buying all those four or five artists that they are used to buy, they, but they never had time to actually explore the rest of the program. So I think it's a really wonderful time for artists that aren't so well known because they, I think it's a great opportunity for 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 that part of the system. Yeah. 
Agreed. Yvonne, Laura, anything to add on either of those notes about which um, artists you felt were doing really well from your program and or um, new collectors you were engaging with or, or meeting? Um, I mean, for us, I have to say that, of course, the collectors we've worked with before, um, we continue to work with during the pandemic. I almost had the feeling they wanted to keep us in business and kept on buying just because we have been taking care of each other for so long. Um, for new collectors, we also work with many new collectors, uh, surprisingly, through Instagram and also because we started exhibiting younger artists during the crisis. Um, as I said, we concentrated first on less expensive works, so that helped a little bit also by tackling um, new collectors. Um, and um, sorry, I lost my thought. What were I? Oh, yeah, the artists. Um, I, I mean, yes, the paintings work better. It's just easier to sell online. Um, but it wasn't only painting. But I have to say that all our artists that have been painting and have been successfully painting, they continue to do well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yvonne, anything to add? Or if not, we can, can move on to the next question if it feels um, all yeah. covered. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the next round of questions I think we've started to tap into already was really about leading into local. Um, Tiago, you talked about that in terms of local sort of fairs and things. And uh, Laura, you talked about that in terms of the fair you hosted in the gallery. Um, I'd love for Laura to maybe share a little bit about Berlin Gallery Weekend that just happened and how that went as it was sort of seen as the first big back to school event for the art world in many ways. Obviously nowhere near the size or scale of a fair, but still in terms of people coming and both the local community coming out and then sort of the broader regional community where they could safely. How was that for you? Uh, actually very well. I mean, it always worked well. I think it was our most successful fair after Basel, always Berlin Gallery Weekend. I think the concept is just so easy to navigate through and it's just yeah. so much fun for everyone. I don't know if everyone knows it, but it's just galleries open late they all show their best works. It's like a fair all over the city and there's a lot of dinners and the, and this all didn't happen this year. So it was a little bit different, but the weather was nice. So people were hanging out outside and um, it was different, but it was always also a little bit the same like it used to be. We did very well. Um, it was, I think that concepts like this can navigate us through times like these. I mean, we've never experienced something like that, but um, everything that's spread out and isn't concentrated on one room and uh, for galleries also, it doesn't cost as much. Um, we're, it's our home base, it's our home base collectors, but people are coming from all, I mean, we really miss all our international clients. Cool. They're not coming, they usually came and Gallery Weekend used to be in May, so all the Americans came for Basel. It was really nice. Um, and this we miss, of course. So I haven't seen them in so long. It, yeah. It's interesting. There's an, a kind of ongoing debate in the art world about whether or not regional fairs are more successful for galleries or these gallery mm -hmm. weekends. And both exist. You know, there's a Beijing Gallery Weekend, Berlin Gallery Weekend. They're, they're sort of popping up all over the place. And I think part of that is because they are so successful as a model. It utilizes the existing space. It drives traffic into the actual space. Everyone shows their best, their best works. And yeah. it really works both in normal times because I've been going to Berlin Gallery Weekend for many, many years and loving it. But it also works particularly well in these sort of um, different times when we need yeah. to, to lean on ourselves um, and our local communities more. So great to hear that, that that proved to be true for you. Yvonne, let's pivot to you because 
I don't know if this is true or not. From afar, it's always felt like the Hong Kong art community was so vibrant and so um, community driven and really supportive of one another. And that in the wake of Art Basel in Hong Kong being canceled, which obviously was a huge blow for, for both uh, morale and economics there, that everyone really tried to band together and support one another and drive traffic to each other and form platforms. So I, I'd just love to hear what happened in Hong Kong for you. Yeah, I mean, we're very glad that we have, you know, collectors and friends, you know, they also, you know, who have a quite a following on social media and they've been so supportive, you know, like they come to our openings and we also, you know, coordinate our opening dates with, you know, other galleries in the building and nearby so that we get, you know, like a maximum flow of visitors. And I think everyone in general has been super supportive and like really be present. And I think it's a good time right now to communicate with your, you know, your fellow art world friends and colleagues to really deepen that local community if you haven't been already. Um, and um, I don't know if you guys have heard of um, the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association. Um, so it's, um, it's basically a collective of all these um, different Hong Kong galleries and we're members and we um, basically in an effort to boost the promotion, they have been introducing a lot of different, you know, um, programs and social media um, like introduction for each of their member galleries. And um, they also collaborated with um, Tai Kun and then where they launched this um, boutique art fair called Unscheduled and it was a huge success. Um, I mean, it's like a major fundraising event and art fair, um, and there are like lots of partnership as well. So I think, you know, that really drives, you know, the local audience, you know, to come see art and really regenerate, um, you know, the local art scene. And, and, and I think in general, um, a very strong press and social media campaign was like implemented. Yeah. You know? I think that really, really helped, you know, to both international and local audience. And I think it's a really good time to reach out, actively reach out to your, you know, your major art titles, um, you know, like FT, Art Newspaper, um, Art Asia Pacific, South China Morning Post, and also, you know, a lot of the key, um, key lifestyle art media, you know, including, you know, Tatler, Prestige, Vogue, um, yeah, among many others. That's great. Tiago, anything else you want to add about Sao Paulo? I, I know you sort of touched on this a little bit before. No, I think I'm okay. Great. So then for the last couple of minutes before we start to take questions, I would just love to ask each of you to sort of look ahead at the future. Um, I would imagine that you guys utilize this time to really look at your gallery's business strategy, review all your expenses, determine ROI and, and viability of initiatives going forward. Um, I'm curious if you reached any important conclusions about future operations. Um, for example, Tiago, you already shared um, a, a big change in that you'll, you'll be working more in the primary market. Uh, Laura actually already shared that the gallery is, was moving away from fairs even before all of this happened happened. Um, so I'm curious about any of those kinds of any other important decisions around, will you invest more in digital in the coming years? Will you, you know, be reducing events? Will you be collaborating more with other galleries? Or when things return to normal, would you ideally like to go back to the status quo as it was before? Um, and in terms of business and operations? Uh, Yvonne, why don't you start us off? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, during lockdown, you know, I think um, we have so much time you know, at home, you know, so I think we've been, you know, globally speaking, I think um, across all three spaces, uh, we've been really trying to, you know, improve our gallery database, you know, I and mean, I think back then, you know, in terms of our um, database, you know, there might not be, you know, enough um, videos, you know, for individual artworks, you know, there, I mean, there are a lot of detail shots and installation shots, but I think now it's a really good time to, I mean, document your artworks properly, you know, because I mean, you know, it would be a click away from a client's computer or iPad, you know, you can view the works in the videos, you know, and you can, you know, chat with them on FaceTime, you know, so, so I thought that was like quite important in terms of, you know, redocumenting your, um, yeah, your um, artworks and everything. And then I think a thoughtful presentation, clear and consistent with our program and showcasing information in general. Um, I think it's also quite important, you know, to um, for community building. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Laura? Um, I think that uh, our own art fair showed us that we want to tap into this field a little bit more. So um, we only worked in the primary market and will continue to work in the secondary market from now on. And we'll continue with our art fair, which is also supporting our local galleries because everyone can apply, show their works. Uh, they don't have to um, pay for a participation fee. And so we were really successful with that. I think another thing that we want to concentrate on is um, public art um, because this is something that always kept us going through times like these. And we're actually working on many public art projects at the moment and will continue to do so uh, with our expertise that we acquired over the years. Um, also with artists that aren't ours that we don't represent. And I think that the gallery is constantly changing. So um, we will find another way to navigate around the market. As for fairs, as I said, we cut down on fairs uh, before, but this doesn't mean that we won't participate in fairs. I mean, we're doing Art Cologne if it happens in November. Um, of course, Art Basel is always something that we do. Um, so I think that we're always trying, like, it's a trial and error. So we never know what we do or not do in the future. So, but this is, I think um, these are the things that are gonna change a little bit, yeah. Great. Tiago, anything else to share? Although you already shared a very important new direction for the gallery. Yeah, well, we are super happy with this new space. And uh, I think it's very early to, to establish what the results of this pandemic is gonna be in the art world or the fair system or anything. But I think we can have a glimpse of, you know, what will, I think from a lot of the conversations that I've had with the uh, other uh, gallery owners and uh, colleagues, and I think everyone realized that the way, the way things were going before, it was a bit too much. I mean, a lot of the galleries were, a lot of the galleries had such huge overheads just to stay part of the system. And uh, and you, I think a lot of the galleries just realized that uh, the system doesn't work the same for, for everyone. So you need to find exactly what kind of fairs you should do or what how, how much you should be traveling, how much you shouldn't be traveling, where you should be traveling to. So I think I think this will, will, I don't think, uh, I think everyone should be still, should be, be doing the fairs and uh, the big, the very good fairs should stay. Uh, uh, they, they will have, any, I mean, I mean, they will work as they, have, have they, as they have always worked. But I think a lot of, I think they, it will, it will, the, 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 I think the fauna within the player is going to change a little bit. I don't think, I think people don't feel so much the obligation of, you know, I need to be in this fair, I need to be at that fair. Otherwise, you know, what's, you know, I think that, uh, in, that, the, 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 the worrisome about the image of, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, you know, they're going to, my gallery is not going to be, Remembered if I'm not part of all these uh, events, so I think I think that's going to change a lot, and uh, it's going to I think it's going to be very interesting for the local communities. I think I think like uh, you know like uh, like Laura mentioned, they're doing something for their community. They're bringing local galleries. They're bringing local artists. We are going to studio visits. We're opening a second space here, so we are doing a lot for our local. Uh, community. So I think uh, we we intend to stay a lot more in Sao Paulo. We intend to travel less. Probably more we'll, strategically. Yeah, exactly. But we will continue to travel. We need to meet people. We need to do absolutely to see the museums. We need to go see the exhibitions. We need to have visit the artists, etc. Uh, you know, everyone in the world. This, the, the the online doesn't replace, but it was. But maybe we should, we don't need to travel so much as we used to. 
Yeah, I think um, what I'm hearing from each of you and what I have heard from a lot of other people is is very similar. It's we all miss our international collectors, our international friends and traveling, but the plan is to do it a little bit more strategically next year, um, not to feel like you have to be everywhere, but to be in the right places, to invest more in time at home, obviously to you know continue to up the game on the digital front, but with the realization that the digital cannot and will not replace real life, you know, that it is a supplement, it is another tool, but it is not a replacement. And certainly of those relationships, which have sustained many galleries during this time, those relationships were built before the pandemic uh, in person, as so Laura sort of alluded to, uh, collectors wanting to keep them in business. Similarly, I was listening to a panel the other day with a bunch of collectors, and they all expressed that exact sentiment, this feeling of responsibility of wanting to keep their galleries that they cared about in business, take care of artists, uh, provide more philanthropy to the museums who are struggling right now. And on their side, the fair fatigue that perhaps they had started to feel has now evaporated and been replaced by this sort of urgent desire to travel, to see art in person, to commune with people. So hopefully, obviously there are a lot of negatives from this pandemic and from the situation, but hopefully we'll also see some positives as we come out of it. Um, I wanted to take a couple questions, but I've not really seen any come through on the message board, but I'll, I'll officially open it up to questions to see if anyone wants to share any on the chat for our last two or three minutes. Maybe we've exhausted everyone and all the possibilities with, with our mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and one more, one more minute. All right. I think, um, ah, Georgina has asked, are gallery weekends going to replace fairs? Which is something I we'd sort of started to talk about, um, but I would welcome you all to, to answer that as well, if you have a particular thoughts. It's a I great agree. question. What, what, gallery weekend came to replace fairs? Is that the question? Yeah, will gallery will the gal gallery weekend concept replace fairs? I think there's been a lot of talk, particularly on the regional level. I don't think there's less of the the feeling that that will happen to say an Art Basel, which has a very specific function and it is deeply international and and important to be so. But there have been some debates among regional fair directors and, and gallery weekend supporters as to which is more successful for, for a gallery. Does it make more sense for Berlin to say, have a small art fair, or does it make more sense for Berlin to have a gallery weekend? Or perhaps as you have illustrated this year, Lara, maybe, maybe it's both, I don't know. But I welcome yeah. thoughts on Georgina's question. I think I think uh, Gallery Weekend is incredibly immersive on the on the on the city scene, but you have only one perspective, so you can't really meet American. Uh, you can you can't see gallery uh, galleries from America, from Asia, from South America if you go to Berlin Gallery Weekend. So I think it's extremely interesting. Uh, uh, because you actually you you dive into that scene and you really get to know what happens in that city and you really once you leave you you understand uh, what the system what the gallery what which galleries you like which uh, you know but the, the fair makes sense because it's an opportunity you know people will as much we have time now but once this pandemic is over we're not going to have so much time left in our hands. So fair is, in the end of the day, is a really great time saver for if you just, if you can go and see two hundred galleries, your galleries that are the best galleries that you know are around at that time uh, over one week in one city and just meet everyone and it's it makes a lot of sense. It's very practical. It's, it's one plane ride and you can see everything. But of course, it's also not as interesting and not as immersive as a gallery weekend in my opinion. But yeah, I think 
I think they both serve different functions and actually can be mutually gratifying. Um, oftentimes when I'll go to an art fair, I'll discover a new gallery or two or three, and then it makes me want to go and explore that city. Um, you know, it, it's a different experience to go to Sao Paulo when you know exactly who the main galleries are to go and visit and you can sort of pre-design your itinerary because you already know Luisa Strina, you already know Mendes, what you've already know your gallery, you've already formed those relationships. So I agree the gallery weekend is sort of the beautiful deep dive into a city, into a culture, um, but it, it can't replace the art fair. Uh, and, and nor necessarily should it. it, they're different and they serve different yeah. functions perhaps. Uh, Yvonne, Laura, any, any other thoughts? Feel free to disagree. Um, well, I completely agree. No. Yeah. Same here. I think we're, we're all on the same page. Well, thank you all for your time. I believe Lucia may join us to say goodbye. Looks like he may not be able to. Um, oh, wait, hold on, one more question. How about new initiatives? Galleries get united with museums um, to show arts and part of the sales goes to donate the operations. Um, I'm not sure I specifically understand the question, but let's start with the beginning part of it about how about new initiatives? Uh, do you see new models coming up, uh, collaborations with museums? Um, or other other things in the pipeline for you? Anybody? Well, I, I, I have never thought of uh, collaborating with museums, per se. You know, we help uh, museums as often as we can, but we have never actually developed uh, we actually, we actually did with the Museum of Modern Art from Sao Paulo, we did a series of live talks, but there was, you know, it was a content, it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't anything related to the museum's program or our program, because there's always, it's always, you know, I, that relationship is always a little tricky. Uh, yeah, I think in some ways this is the question better for museums actually. Um, I think galleries have long been interested in supporting museums and collaborating with them, and they do support their artists' exhibitions and catalogs and events at the museum. If there were to be sort of a new modus operandi of this collaboration between galleries and museums, I think the museums would need to, to spearhead that, as they often try to protect their ethical integrity by drawing certain lines in, in what their relationship with a gallery looks like. So short of I guess a fundraiser, as I think this person might be alluding to as well. There's, there's not an obvious way to collaborate on that front. Lucia, over to you. Oh, it's gone again. Well, I, I would just like to thank all of our panelists um, for being here. It was such a pleasure speaking with all of you. And then I'll let Lucia close out the online conference if he's back. So many, many thanks to you all for this session. We are finishing this new format on Light Talks. And let me thank Sol and Daniela and all my team at Talking Galleries for their special effort in this new format. I will also thank all the panelists that have participated in these sessions and, of course, all the attendees that have joined us from this new format, from home or from their office. And we look forward to see you all in our next 2021 hybrid symposium in Barcelona and online. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you.